Okay, should I start or do you think we should wait a bit few a bit more? Just start. I believe people will arrive. Okay, so hello everybody. Welcome to our presentation that will be focusing on uh, not much results, but just the problems of simulating propagation of cryptocurrency transactions. I am the second author in that uh, uh, in the row, Marcel Marek, and also my colleague uh, Vladimir Yezabek is here as well. He just waved uh, at you. <laughs> and you might have heard Vladimir Vesely uh, yesterday doing the, the same presentation in the in the small group. So, uh, wait. Now, uh, just small introduction who we are. We are sort of uh, sitting on two chairs uh, at once. One is the NetSearch uh, limited, uh, uh, limited company uh, established in 2015 as a university spin off. And that's the second chair that we are sitting in is the uh, Brno University of Technology, where we pretty much everyone that is part of the company studied or still studying either masters or PhD and doing uh, a little bit of research and development, a little bit of uh, production uh, product development, mainly for law enforcement uh, agencies. You can find out more at, uh, at the URL. Uh, what are the areas of interest is that we do cryptocurrency forensics. That's going to be a tightly uh, connected uh, topic uh, that I will be presenting today. We also do some password cracking and traffic interception. Although we are not going to need a traffic interception in the same sense uh, in this presentation, but it's also connected because uh, we will be talking about monitoring network traffic uh, to get some off-chain metadata for the crypto crypto forensics. Uh, so yeah, again, what's the agenda and goal of this presentation is to to present the state of the art of blockchain forensics, present the challenging challenges and existing simulators that are capable of simulating Bitcoin or, or uh, cryptocurrency in general. And then we will focus on uh, a way how to exploit Bitcoin peer-to-peer uh, -peer network to got, gather some additional data. And then we will talk about the CRISIM, uh, the hopefully uh, outcoming simulator that uh, will be the, the goal, the, the result of, uh, of our project. But yeah, like I can mention this presentation is going to be focused on the state of the art. What are the problems and what are the uh, outlined goals? Uh, how to uh, how to achieve it, but not so much on the resulting uh, simulator. Not just yet. Uh, what is possible? Yes, uh, we will go ahead and talk about what is possible uh, actually to to get from the uh, cryptocurrency peer and transaction geolocation and talk about what uh, simulation uh, simulators actually exist uh, what is the state of the art so just to give you a brief introduction into the world of cryptocurrency here we have a bitcoin network it's uh, very similar for all the existing cryptocurrencies but there might be slight uh, slight uh, uh, details that uh, are different but in general they work very much uh, very much the same so you have a peer-to-peer -peer network of uh, nodes uh, that constitutes the bitcoin uh, bitcoin network you might have some uh norm by the way can you see my cursor can you see the mouse yes we can see okay because uh, i cannot uh, paint uh, because i don't have a touch screen as Vladimir did yesterday, so just to highlight it with uh, with the mouse. So in this slide, you can see the peer to peer network. There are two different types of, of nodes. When you are e either just a normal user that 
uh, basically wants to just use the network to send the uh, send a transaction or receive uh, some uh, some funds. Then you have specialized nodes that serve the purpose of uh, mining that actually generate the the blocks and uh, validate the transaction, etc. And all of them are connected together into a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network. If you want to send money to to somebody, you're going to use some uh, some application that uh, is able to say how much you want to send. You might add some, some additional label, and then you specify the the receiver address and uh, just issue the money. If you want to be the the miner, then you need uh, additional dedicated uh, software that's actually validating the transaction and uh, basically putting them into a, si a single block and then propagating them to to the network. And then what you get uh, out of it is a for example, transaction like this, when you have some input address, you have the, the value of the input, and then you have uh, multiple uh, addresses on the output and the specific value of, of that output. You can also have multiple addresses on the input side uh, as well. That's sort of the one of the differences between a transaction that uh, you are used to from uh, uh, your normal uh, transaction aka fiat money transfer you would usually when i would be sending uh, some money to vladimir i would be uh, on the sender side and vladimir would be on the receiver side so there would be just two of us but in bitcoin you can have multiple input side on the input and multiple entities on the on the output what's uh, yeah what constitutes the cryptocurrency intelligence you can separate it into a three parts. The first one is blockchain forensics. There you have the cryptocurrency address that, oh, sorry, I wanted to highlight it. Uh, that identifies the, uh, the, the address, the, the wallet that uh, holds the, or that is associated with, with the funds. Then you have the cryptocurrency transactions, which is identified by, uh, by a hash that identifies the, the transaction, which uh, uh, consists of uh, the inputs and outputs, uh, the unspent transaction, uh, uh, unspent transaction outputs on the input side and on the output side. Then in the uh, off-chain data, you have uh, some uh, open and closed source intelligence, either by scraping web pages, uh, either public uh, internet and darknet or monitoring social networks or some locally available information, I would say from the closed source intelligence, meaning that the law enforcement agency have some additional data that can, uh, as, uh, they, they can associate with either a transaction hash or either with cryptocurrency address, maybe because some victim reported uh, to them that uh, they have been scammed, etc. So they can mark the uh, addresses and transaction in the in the blockchain with additional data. And the third part is by monitoring the peer-to-peer -peer network. You can uh, basically associate the uh, uh, inventory, the data that is transferred between the the nodes with IP address and record it all uh, record it all into a pickup file, even maybe for later analysis and et cetera. You, uh, you can see just a uh, example of the metadata that you are able to, to store. Because uh, if you're monitoring the network, acti network communication, you can uh, see the start uh, of the activity. You can see the end of the activity. There's also user agent that is sending, uh, uh, that the node is sending, protocol version, and services that uh, the node is offering. And you can monitor that for maybe later, uh, for an additional source of identifying the, the nodes and the originator of the transaction. But we will get uh, to that in more detail later. So what can be or what are the investigators' goals? Usually, if you are law enforcement agency, you are uh, investigating some crime. So who has committed the crime? 
who is the real person behind the cryptocurrency address or a transaction and what device originated cryptocurrency transaction because if you can do uh, i mean if you can do the real person that's probably your end goal then you're fine but even to be able to identify the device of uh, of the originator that can help you a lot because then you might use uh, another tool not necessarily uh, crypto uh, tracking tools but some other ways how to identify who this device belong to and also where is money associated with the crime now uh, basically to monitor how the funds transfer through the through the network so doing just blockchain uh, blockchain forensics if you know the entry point uh, and you have uh, information about the exit point then you are able to backtrack uh, the uh, information in between because the blockchain is uh, blockchain is public so you can actually go through the uh, inner transaction and figure out through what exchange or through what service it went and who paid what that's not a problem the issue is how to actually put a real name to to this long uh, to this long string which is sort of pseudo anonymous. Uh, this is just a, a sort of view what uh, kind of information you can associate with uh, an address. Uh, but yeah, I'll just skip through this. Basically, by using the open source intelligence, you can scrape the, this uh, Bitcoin address to a, a Bitcoin forum. And if you are so lucky, then you would get a photo of the owner. And you can you might use the the photo uh, to to basically scan through your maybe may, maybe government uh, uh, documents and see who that might be. But this is rarely the case that you would get a photo with the uh, Bitcoin address. You can also use some uh, uh, other analytics to see what kind of behavior the uh, the address uh, is doing. But I would say it's not really really relevant to our case. Usually the address is part of a cluster or uh, you can call it a wallet. That might, might be the, the usual term that you will see. And then basically by uh, identifying all the other uh, addresses within a wallet, you can investigate further. But yeah, in this case, you see what uh, this uh, wallet actually communicated with where it sent money and who sent money to that address as well and then yeah visualize it basically to to track it but uh, okay this is not uh, the real status you cannot just go to the address and get uh, immediately which is sort of the uh the originator uh, and uh, it would just work that okay we got uh, an ip address of uh, of the source it's not uh, that easy because as the peer-to-peer uh, -peer network is working, the way how uh, the, uh, for example, uh, transactions are mined or the blocks are mined, that you, you as a single user are nowadays are not able to compete uh, with the mining pool. So you are not able to actually mine the, 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 the next block. So you group together with another miners to form a mining pool. And then when you mine the block, the address that is associated with the rewards for the mining does not represent a single user, but it represents the, the mining pools. Plus different uh, uh, mining pools uh, uses the different uh, mining protocol. Uh, so it's difficult to to monitor all of them because uh, yeah they constantly changing. Also, not every node. If you see the the nodes marked uh, as a user, uh, or not every device, not every user can actually be the the full node because uh, for Bitcoin you need uh, almost 500 gigabits of data to be able to verify the transaction to be able to send a new transaction out. So in terms of mobile devices, this is un, uh, unrealistic that you would download half a tera of data just to be able to pay for an ice cream. So you get some other uh, devices that basically outsource this uh, 
to to a full node and you use just a some light client that enables you to generate the transaction and send it to somebody who have the full blockchain and that will actually do the transaction and again there are different uh, protocols that do the communication with the backbone with the full full node yeah for the blockchain back, backbone and doing even one level more because the uh, bitcoin uh, network is able to do only five transactions per second so nowadays you have some layer two protocols in this case lightning protocol that basically is able to do the transactions out of uh, the the blockchain out of the public ledger and you just doing uh, some uh, transactions between the between oh yeah let's use the example previous i want to send money to vladimir but maybe i'm buying an ice cream from him every day and because i trust him i will open the transaction and keep it open maybe for a whole month because every day i will come there and spend just a few cents for the for the ice cream so it's not necessary for us to pay a huge fee just a small amount and once either we decide that we want to close the, the account or how we want to call it the transaction i no longer want to buy ice cream from vladimir so it's not necessary to keep the tab open or vladimir maybe doesn't believe me that i will pay uh, it or maybe he's just closing shop so at any point of time using the litecoin uh, uh litecoin sorry lightning network he can terminate the transaction and send it back to the layer one so it will actually reflect in the blockchain and it will be a legit uh, bitcoin transaction but until that point we can handle all all our transactions just between us and since this is sort of local transaction because it's standing only between uh, node one and two which would be me and vladimir we don't need to propagate the information throughout the blockchain etc etc and sync it then it's much much faster and it's also much more scalable you can have uh, much much more uh, transaction per per second and then only once you want to finalize the the transaction or finalize some uh, uh, some uh, exchange then you send the information back to the layer one to the bitcoin and propagate it to the normal bitcoin uh bitcoin flow but the benefit is that you can actually avoid the the big fee and also uh, avoid the i would say small throughput of transactions per second and i would say this is just one example of the layer two protocols there can be multiple multiple of them so again you add another difficulty basically what kind of protocols you need to be able to understand to be able to monitor the network and yeah this is a uh, one uh, site that is actually doing that to, to monitor the network it's one ml.com you can visit yourself and see see the details how the uh, lightning network uh, works leveling up even more here you can see how many uh, cryptocurrencies are currently uh, currently exist and just to say there's a lot of them to be able to understand and actually write a pa packet decoder for all of them that is a basically each of them could be a task for a dedicated team so it's uh, unrealistic to be able to do it as sort of a researcher or even a company to be able to understand uh, all of them here you have a list of a uh, simulators that supports uh, a bitcoin uh, bitcoin protocol and i would say at various uh, various levels uh, but they are usually uh, uh, focused only on a a single task or and they don't really offer some uh, general generalized uh, generalized use cases to be able uh, for example to answer our research question of uh, identifying or uh, the originator of a transaction of a transaction and match it with the geolo geolocation metadata 
Okay, now going to would say more detail, more the the, the meat of uh, of this presentation. Uh, what we actually want to do, how to exploit the Bitcoin peer to peer protocol to get the data that we are interested in. Bitcoin protocol is codified by Bitcoin Foundation. It's binary, but it's not encrypted. Uh, you cannot read it just by uh, sort of sniffing it and passing it through, uh, like a, saving it to a text file, but just opening it by Wireshark, you can easily see all the messages uh, that the nodes are sending to, to each other, or at least to, to you. Uh, yeah, and there you can see what are the default ports, and I would say that's not uh, necessarily interesting. Here we have all the messages that uh, exist there. Well, the ones that are interested for us is the inventory message, uh, the get data message, and the transaction uh, message. So, uh, yeah, discovery, I will skip this part. You can maybe go through it. Uh, once offline, but it's just detailed how you sort of spin up the nodes and how you connect to the network. It's not that uh, interested in our uh, topic. Uh, okay, connecting to node again, that's not really what we are about here. Now we are getting to the interesting part. Imagine you have four nodes, node A, node B, node C, node D. Node A have uh, uh, some uh, uh, transaction or block or, or some uh, other information, it sends the inventory to its neighbor. Since the node B, the, the neighboring node does not have the transaction or, or block in question, or in, in this case, a transaction, it tells the node, uh, it not, tells the node A, please send me the, the transaction and node A responds with the actual transaction data. And because node B is connected to node C and node D, it does the same thing as the node A did in the first step. It sends its neighbors information about uh, the new inventory that it received. The node C and node D either uh, sort of discard the, the message or in case they don't have the data yet, they will again send get, get data response and node B will Yeah, uh, Marcel is stuck to uh, internet connection and uh, he will be back in a minute. Yeah, he's now back. Yeah, sorry, sorry for that. You know, we are just a company focused on networking. So obviously we have network issues. Uh, okay, so now you can see, I hope that you caught uh, this slide that how you propagate the, the transaction to, to all the nodes. And basically what we, or what I talk about here in theory, here you can hear, uh, here you can see it in real, where this is a communication that some node sends, uh, it has inventory data, the neighbors replied, okay, I'm interested in this data, and then the node actually sent the, the transaction data in the response message. This is sort of, uh, or the, the way how you can, uh, uh, utilize the the peer-to-peer -peer network is that uh, you're gonna try to peer with everyone so in that case whoever sends the uh, the transaction it will send it to you as well because you are peering with the node and then you can say okay this one is the originator of uh, of that transaction within the network and since you know the ip address of the neighbor you can say, okay, this one is the originator of the of the transaction, but it's not that easy. First of all, to be able to peer with everyone, it takes some resources, but it's uh, yeah, it's doable. And there are already a we say service that is doing that. They peering with uh, all the nodes just to be able to basically provide you with these statistics, how many uh nodes are in uh in what country 
and some additional uh, additional statistics uh, uh, in details here. There is another uh, another uh, research uh, group that is focusing on that. Here you can see basically uh, the uh, client version, different client versions throughout time. So you can see what's the sort of the, the major version or how the new version actually propagates through uh, through the nodes. Uh, how uh, fast the, the, does the network actually deploys the, the new version? Here you can see the slides sort of so how we attribute the IP addresses of the nodes that we are peering with. So you have some IP address, you uh, add the, uh, the country code and city using the using a geolocation database. And then because you have IP address, you can get the autonomous system and organization number for the uh, BGP, BGP peering. Well, yeah, here you have example of notes from uh, Czech Republic uh, together with a map and the activities, uh, etc. Here you can see what the, are the what is the agent and what are the services. Uh, it's not uh, your direct source of uh, information, but you can use it to get additional uh, additional data because uh, yeah, you can identify based on protocol version or use agent if that is sort of unique enough. And the services, etc. But uh, finally, getting to to the real meat. Why is peer monitoring tricky? Because if you consider the network like this, there are some nodes that might be behind a net. There might be inside uh, inside a, a Tor, or or they might use uh, VPN. So you are not able even connect to them or if you are connected to them you don't really see their ip address in case of the tor exit node so you have to consider only the nodes that you are able to uh, to actually reach that you can connect to and yeah currently the bitcoin network node consists of about fourteen thousand reachable nodes but then you have the unreachable nodes, and the estimate is between 40,000 and 100,000 nodes that are unreachable. So you can see how that uh, uh, the volume is much, much uh, larger for the nodes that you are not able to connect to. So the other way might be to basically generate enough nodes that you force or allow them to connect to you. So you're not trying to connect to them, but basically by spawning enough nodes, they will. Uh, by sort of a luck, connect uh, connect to you in this uh, yeah in this uh, scheme. So what you, can you do if you are really peering with everyone? You can uh, conduct correlation based on time of detected event. I didn't uh, sort of emphasize on that, but even if you are peering with everyone, there's no uh, you're not guaranteed to receive the transaction from the first from the actual originator of the transaction because it uses uh, it uses some uh, random timer to actually just send the transaction out and we will get back to, uh, we will get to to that in the next slide but yeah so you need to conduct a correlation based of time of the detected events if you have the monitoring node you might see a uh, for a single transaction you see all the neighboring nodes uh, that sent or propagated this transaction together with a with a time. And if you have multiple uh, monitoring nodes, you combine it into a single table, and then you obviously try to select uh, the the nodes that or the host that have the soonest time, and then you try to do basically correlation on 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 top of that because you see the same node on many of the monitoring uh, nodes and yeah then you can propagate it in some sort of order of the ip addresses that you saw for that particular at the transaction including a, a time yeah here we have a geolocation example for bitcoin address that belonging to a ukraine government so yeah you have some address transaction and then you can sort of plot it on a, a map based on the count of uh, of the based on the number of transactions 
that are feeding into your uh, monitoring wallet address. Again, there are different algorithms how the uh, transaction propagate, uh, whether if you are inbound or outbound peers. So whether you connected to the node or if the node connected to you, the Bitcoin protocol uses two different approaches. It uses Poisson distribution with a lambda of 30, meaning that for uh, each uh, peer, there will be a uh, uh, event in, uh, on average in two seconds. For the inbound peers, there is a delta of 12, meaning that there will be a, a message in, uh, on average in, in five seconds. How does it look like, like if you just visualize the, the Poisson distribution? how it might look and how it actually looks like in terms of uh, number of sent messages. Here you can see that for the outbound peers, there is a sort of dedicated uh, timer for each of them. So you see uh, throughout time when each uh, peer received the message, but for the inbound peers, once the timer expires, you tell it, uh, you send the message to, to all of them at once. And yeah, and like even if you are, yeah, in real time, in real world, although because uh, in our testing transaction, although you know that this one is the real originator, it just happens so that none of those, none of the monitoring nodes saw the IP address as the first, uh, as the originator of the, of the transaction. So it's not uh, enough just to record the time when you saw the when you saw the transaction propagate through network. You need to uh, apply some uh, uh, some uh, additional criteria. Uh, different. Okay. Yeah. Why is it uh, why is it different? Because each cryptocurrency uses a little bit uh, different uh, a little bit different code to to actually trigger the uh, the distribution of the transactions uh yeah the distribution is also so you need to basically you cannot have a generic solution that would cover all of the cryptocurrencies you need to always tailor it for the the specific one and yeah so a basically described you the uh, research questions and now you are wondering what is actually the the answer the answer will be here Hopefully, in the next two months, next 12 months, sorry, uh, we will be presenting the results at the next uh, next Omnet Summit. That basically we will be able to answer the question: Are we able to actually geolocate the transaction just from the propagation data, or once we simulate the uh, the Bitcoin propagation network? Or Bitcoin transaction propagation uh, network, we might determine that just based on the uh, randomness, based on the statistics, you are not able to correlate the data with a IP address that would uh, sort of identify the the source. And that is all from me. And now, hopefully, there's time for your questions. What's the uh, it might be a little bit over time, but yeah, hopefully if you have a question. Yeah, my question is, is it also possible or are you planning to work also on layer two monitoring? Because that's a quite a different thing, but I believe uh, that's a different uh, type of communication where it's it's on our roadmap, but uh, as I, hopefully I was able to 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 convey the information, it's not uh, exactly easy to do it for Bitcoin, and we are extending to to Litecoin, and in a sort of long term goal is also to monitor Light uh, Lightning Network, but it's not in terms of weeks or months, but it's mm -hmm. maybe like a. a after after like six months we we might get into it but first we need mm -hmm. to sort of uh, figure out all the all the details for bitcoin litecoin and then yeah uh -huh. other. but because yeah definitely the the layer two is really interesting uh interesting things to to focus on so yeah we 
we are pl planning on that as well. And for the simulator itself, you are planning to run it on a real network. So, I mean, you are planning to run it on INET or it's more more generic abstract communication uh, like you just want to actually program the delays between the peers and then you go well, with that uh, the, actually the, the the first phase sort of is to do it uh, outside of imet like mm -hmm. you said just a generic uh, uh, node or just generic module with uh, uh, changing the the delay but uh, i would push for the ultimate goal to actually implement it uh, in inet it will obviously not be full bitcoin protocol but at least the, the part that we are interested in would mimic the the real work scenario much better because it would take into account all the all the underlying uh, network uh, network protocols mm -hmm. but yeah the, the first step is definitely is going to be just a generic node and generic messages basically just to simulate the transaction uh, propagation. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else? Any question? If no, then I would like to thank you for the presentation. You're most welcome. Yeah, and then I'm stopped the recording.